Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining in to the session on Making Augmented Reality a Reality at BAE Systems. My name is Angie Stover from BAE Systems here in New York, Pennsylvania, and I am really looking forward to spending some time talking to you today as part of the Mantec Smart Manufacturing Conference. So I lead the strategic manufacturing team at our York production site, which includes our industrial engineering team that does upfront planning for the production processes, as well as continuous improvement of those processes, and also includes some higher level strategic planning initiatives, both to at a high level plan where work is going to be performed for our builds, but also to look at manufacturing manufacturing technology. So uh, the topics I'm going to discuss with you today come from that manufacturing technology part of our team. Um, and we're going to have three topics. So uh, the first one I'm going to talk through is some, some virtual, or I'm sorry, augmented reality efforts we've got going on. I'm going to talk about both our electronic system sector um, and some work instruction efforts that they have. I'm also going to talk about some early steps that our combat vehicle, vehicle sector has taken um, at incorporating augmented reality onto the shop floor. And then I'm going to move into some initial steps we've taken at using virtual reality to do some initial build validations. Uh, and I will spend the last few minutes of our talk um, talking about some partnerships that we've had recently uh, where we've been able to automate some of our proprietary weld processes. So uh, thank you for joining it and we'll go ahead and get started with the first topic. So this video um, is going to be a video about our electronic system sector. Uh, they recently partnered with PTC to develop some augmented reality work instructions for their product production sites that build hybrid electric uh, public bus transportation systems. So we'll go ahead and watch this video uh, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the things we're doing here at Combat Vehicles as well. There's huge growth in this market, but it is unsustainable unless we embrace new technology. BE Systems is committed to solving the most complex problems our customers have. Here at BE Systems, we make the electric propulsion for hybrid drive buses. Our production tempo has increased dramatically. We brought on a lot of new people. That's forced us to look at innovative solutions to build product correctly every time. How do we do that? How did we do that? Is with mixed reality. When I first tried a HoloLens, I quickly understood that this technology would have significant implications for our business and that we needed to get out in front of it. We had to find a platform that could help us scale, and that's when we began the conversations with PTC. PTC's mission is to bridge the physical and the digital worlds, whether it's manufacturing, operating, or servicing physical products. When we came along and we had a mixed reality solution to allow them to create experiences for the HoloLens quicker and more efficiently. It's all drag and drop. You don't need a lot of technical expertise. You get up and running right away. It just makes it a lot faster, easier to get a lot of people using the experiences that were created with our software. PTC's mixed reality solution is allowed us to drag and drop our 3D models that we already have to create that work instructions to deliver to our production floor in hours and at a tenth of the cost. We develop a step-by-step -step guide that lets the assembler completely assemble the battery. You're not looking at this in two dimensions anymore on a screen that's far away from you. It's right in front of you. The HoloLens has really become beneficial in allowing us to train new people on this product 30 to 40 percent more efficiently. Using the HoloLens, I was able to cut my assembly time in half. We can understand and we can learn so much faster, efficiently, feel a part of this process. Microsoft has really nailed it with the HoloLens platform and PTC is helping us scale this affordably across the enterprise. 20 years ago, we didn't have personal computers on every bench. 10 years ago, we didn't have 3D printers. Now I can't imagine building without those. And I think this is what the HoloLens represents. It's the next step in the evolution of high-tech manufacturing. The future of mixed reality is really exciting because the possibilities are endless. We're just starting to scratch the surface of it. It really is endless what we're going to be able to do. Where we can go, this is going to help us get there. Okay, so although we're not as far along in our augmented reality journey, journey in the combat vehicle sector, we are starting to bring this technology into small areas of our production process. Um, and obviously planning to, once we've proven success in those small areas, definitely planning to expand the use of that technology in the future. Um, so one of the areas where we've 
brought augmented reality into our production processes is in our paint uh, process. So our paint, the manager of our paint area was named, is named Jim Harvey, and he was looking for more effective and less time consuming ways to apply the camo patterns to our combat vehicles. Um, similar to what you saw in the electronic systems video, we are starting to increase our production tempo as well. And one of the areas where um, we're seeing particular issues with both movement of vehicles in and out of paint booths and things like that, um, and just capacity is in our, our camo paint process. Um, that also is being applied to more and more vehicles where historically we have been doing a lot more single color recently. Um, so um, a good number of the vehicles that we produce for the US Army and the Marine Corps, as well as our international customs customers are now being asked to be camo patterns. Um, vehicles are historically painted uh, in that camo pattern using drawings um, or templates, uh, similar to what you see here where you would have a, um, in our case, we usually use plastic, uh, some sort of plastic template that we can kind of tape on, draw the, the camo patterns, um, or literally measure specific measurement points on the vehicle and hand draw um, the camo pattern. So both of those are time consuming, right? And whether you're drawing them manually and you're trying to specifically measure points of the pattern that have to meet inspection requirements at the end, um, or you're applying these templates and figuring out um, that they're in the right location, um, both of those are time consuming. On top of that, the templates, um, if the camo pattern changes and they actually do change pretty often, um, if the camo pattern changes, those templates now need to be recreated and they're not, um, they're not inexpensive. So we were looking for a, a new approach at how to apply these patterns. Um, and one of the things that we looked at uh, was augmented reality. So we were introduced to uh, a number of partners who had already been doing um, augmented reality camo patterns. Um, and Harvey began to research with those partners and learn from those partners um, how they were using this technology. So, um, while he initiated the effort, um, a number of our of the my industrial engineering team members um, have since gotten involved in the program heavily. Um, we've been looking at the approach now. We had been looking at the approach several years ago as well. Um, there was an upfront barrier to that, though, that uh, in order to be able to project the camo pattern properly, we needed to do a lot of upfront modeling effort that was just similar to the templates, kind of cost prohibitive. Um, now that we've gotten better at augmented reality uh, internally here at BAE Systems. We now have a lot more internal competency for that work. Um, the team that has been working on this latest round of augmented reality has been able to much develop those models much more quickly. Um, they've been able to make simplifications to how we model the camo pattern that also allow us to make those pattern, those models much more uh, efficiently. Um, so that has kind of broken down that upfront barrier to us being able to introduce this into the production area. Um, the other thing we we needed was, we knew we needed something that um, operators felt comfortable using, something that they could rely on every single time to make sure they got the right pattern and that it was placed and located on the vehicle correctly each time. So what we did um, was we started out by exploring this uh, in a very, very conceptual phase. So like I mentioned, we're ramping up in production. So our first cut at this could not be something that impacted our production line. So instead we took just a regular BAE systems truck. Um, we overlaid the model of the vehicle on it and then overlaid the camo pattern on top of that all in this augmented reality environment. Um, and that allowed us to kind of at least see what a physical vehicle would look like, what the model of the vehicle would look like, um, and how that camo pattern would lay over top of that. Um, it, it gave us a, a conceptual idea that this could potentially work, but once we did it, we figured, we, we quickly realized that it wasn't close enough to what we really needed to do to double check that this was gonna work. Um, so we did, we quickly shifted into a demo on the production floor. Um, we actually got several of the operators who apply these camo patterns to use this um, technology put the goggles on, see how it felt, um, and start to actually really give us some good feedback. Um, so uh, a couple things we learned during that first demo was um, the simple way that we had modeled the camo pattern initially uh, meant that the pattern didn't 
kind of conform to all of the aspects of the hull. So you can kind of see in this picture of this is a, a amphibious combat vehicle in the picture here. And you can see that it's got a lot of angles um, and the pattern wasn't conforming to those quite as much as we would want if we were going to be able to actually draw the pattern on. So that was something that we knew we needed to fix um, in order for this to be successful. It, it, we got a lot of other feedback too that I think we sort of expected. Um, com, you know, we asked a lot about level of comfort with wearing the glasses. We asked a lot, uh, the operators asked a lot about what happens. I have other PPE that I need to wear while I'm doing this paint process. How does that all work with these goggles? Um, so all things that we knew we needed to come through in order to, to kind of be successful. Um, so because the, the model didn't really conform to the vehicle, that was the first thing we um, went after. Um, we did some model upgrades to that to try and um, bring the projection of the camo pattern closer to where the actual vehicle surfaces are. And we did a second demo uh, on the production shop floor. Um, what we realized during that one was that different goggles projected the pattern slightly differently or the, the projection of the pattern changed over time for a certain set of glasses. Um, so we did a lot of testing during that second demo, trying to have one operator perform maybe the rear of the vehicle pattern and the other perform the driver's side of the vehicle. And when they got to the corner where the two met, did they actually have the camo pattern lines meet or, you know, two sides of the, the driver's side? Did they meet in the middle actually at where they needed to? And that was to sort of assess whether the goggles were all projecting things the same. And we found out that they weren't um, or they weren't over time. And so right now we are in the process of purchasing the second generation of the HoloLens goggles. Um, we're told that that will, the changes have been made that will mitigate a good bit of that um, repeatability issue. Uh, so we're in the process of purchasing those second generation goggles. Um, and then we will obviously re-demo and hopefully be able to pretty quickly execute into the production environment. Um, yeah, so I think uh, one other thing I'll mention is just how kind of exciting it's been to see these capital investments that our company is making into our manufacturing processes. It's not only going to um, benefit the operators and the company from a profitability standpoint, but it's going to allow us to keep pace with the demand from our customers much better um, because our fleet of combat vehicles is, is rapidly being modernized. And, and to keep up with that pace, we obviously need to be able to have a higher level of throughput. So advanced tools like this are going to help us meet those production demands and also um, keep the highest standards of quality. And that's really the goal. Uh, we need to be able to do both. So um, Still more to come on this, obviously. I had hoped to be able to present that we would be completely done. Um, but with all uh, technology in insertions, you have hiccups. So we're right in the middle of kind of a hiccup that we didn't expect, um, but definitely still seeing kind of a path forward to be able to, to use, use these goggles in a production environment on pretty much um, all of our vehicle platforms as they transition into a camo pattern. So um, thanks for listening to the first topic. So our top second topic is gonna to be virtual assembly, which is really a relatively simple idea. This is the idea that you can build vehicles in a simulated environment before ever touching hardware or making a tool, a fixture. Um, this process allows us to understand the assembly order for a product um, where interferences might crop up that we didn't see in the model, um, sequence challenges that we didn't anticipate in the modeling, um, where we need maybe special tooling or special fixtures or lift tables for ergonomics, um, as well as many other nuances that might come up during um, building a combat vehicle. As the simulation gets more complex, it is becoming clear that virtual reality could be used, um, could be really useful in investigating those complexities uh, so that we can better understand fit function and the overall build process. Um, this process can also kind of help to drive integration across some of our organizational boundaries because we can bring in different teams or different people from different functions and have them investigate or query the model within this virtual environment for the things that they're specifically concerned about. So we might be able to have um, our electrical folks come in and look at the electrical 
uh, parts of our process, the mechanical folks, we might be able to even have quality come in and look at how they're going to inspect the vehicle once it's built. Um, and that would really help us to reduce a lot of the defects that we might see um, crop up during this early design phase um, that we may not find otherwise until the product actually hits the production floor. Um, this process could also help in a lot of ways around change management so that we can fully uh, assure ourselves that we've made all the changes we need to make relative to a design change or a build process change um, and aren't missing anything in our assessment. Um, so we are taking some initial steps into the, this realm of virtual build validation. Um, we've started a pilot where we're partnering with ESI uh, and we're using their ICI do software to perform some validations of specific build processes before we put them on the shop floor. Uh, so we've done that with some new designs. Um, we've also done some work with them where we had to retrofit um, some components into a vehicle. So a little bit assessing of what do we need to take off so that we can put back on the right the right equipment. Do we have the right tools? What's the right sequence? That sort of thing. Um, so a little bit of a flavor of both the, the upfront and the sort of a little bit of the change management piece. Um, but what I'm going to show you next, because we don't have any videos of our specific models that I could share with you today, but I have some videos from um, ESI's work with other partners where they're, they're also using the ICI do software. Um, and I think it's good examples that will um, show you similar things that we were looking at. Um, and similar issues that we found as well during our investigations. So this first video um, is some of the toughest things that we come through in our build process. Um, in some of our vehicles, we have nearly two miles worth of cabling um, that we need to route through that vehicle. Um, and it's often one of the most difficult for us to get right in the, in the modeling phase. Um, so this, this shows you that you can actually use the ICI do software to um, physically work to try and connect, actually physically route the cables, see that the cables aren't long enough, um, spe specify cable lengths with, within the ICI do software um, that can then be rolled back into your design. So um, often we estimate cable lengths and then during the prototype build, we would correct those. Um, this would help us get closer um, if not, you know, get it right the first time in this virtual environment. So I think they're showing you here that you can both um, adjust the length. You could see that first time they did it, that it fit it fit well. It still pulls the cables um, from the other side. So you may even want to make it a little bit longer, but you can see that that, that physicality of the cable is there, that the cable is actually stretchy um, and that you can see that it does have tension there where when it was a little bit shorter. So here now they're showing you also that you can um, identify what's the right way to connect these four cables um, so that they all fit and you have good access to where they connect. So now you can see that in order for him to connect this next one or the hand, I guess the hand to connect the next one, there, there was a little bit of um, less access uh, wire was in the way, but it is possible. So there may be some things you wanna do around um, order there. Uh, again, this is a little bit more clear about kind of routing. Um, these are the things that we would definitely come across in our um, efforts. Here they're going to route a cable and mount it to a, to a structure um, and then also try to connect it. And you can see that it is, again, a little bit too short when it's routed in the, the, the location that was designed for that cable to actually um, connect to its location. So they're going to go into the software and actually change the cable length live. Um, and then show that they're able to uh, connect it once that cable length is adjusted. So here you can see that it's, it's just not long enough to get where it needs to be to connect. So I think we're gonna open up a panel here shortly off to the side and adjust the cable length. We 
Yep, here they go. We're going to add some lengths to that cable. And now you can see that they're able to connect it. So again, these are a lot of um, very, very similar things that we would come across as we were looking at the ability to route cables during um, a combat vehicle build as well. So there they added additional length so that it wasn't interfering with that other component. Um, but what you saw at the bottom there was that once you have validated that you have the right length, you're actually able to export some of that data um, back out to your CAD objects. So um, this next one, again, um, a little bit of a different flavor, but similar from the same, same partner ESI using the same software I see I do. Um, but one of the other points I wanted to get across was it's not just necessarily about um, investigating design and build sequence, but also in this case, you're gonna see that they are um, validating that the tooling or lifting fixtures, or in this case, you know, a lift assist um, is actually gonna work for the process um, that they're looking at. So um, this would be another area where we would definitely want to look at, and we di did look at this during some of our new design builds and find that some of the structures and fixtures that we had designed for um, a new build we're doing uh, needed to be changed before we ever um, got the vehicle structures in to be assembled. Uh, I think the, the um, holding fixture needed to be raised um, several inches in order to be uh, compatible with the the um, turret structure that we were looking at. So this is an interesting little split screen as well, right? You can see what, what the operator is seeing in his virtual reality as well as, as him, um, him working. Um, so there they've, they've installed the fixture onto the vehicle. Now they're going to actually use a tool and um, ICID does have kind of a library of tools, um, but can also import special tooling. Obviously you saw the, the lift assist. Um, so and that's another capability of the software that we have certainly utilized as well as the standard tooling, as well as the, um, as well as the special tooling and fixtures that we can import our own, own models of. Again, he's been, in this case, we'd be checking that you can, you know, connect everything that you have access to rotate and actually perform the, the work that you're performing. So yes, all in all, a, a very, very powerful um, software program that we have found huge value uh, in our short time piloting this with ESI. Uh, so what I did want to go through was just a little bit more specifics about what we've been using the, the software for. Um, so our specific pilot cases, we were able to merge some of our existing vehicle models into this ICI do environment um, and then used those with um, both new kind of draft work instructions that we had um, and in a draft assembly sequence. And we used those to, um, to validate that the work instructions in the build sequence, build sequence were appropriate. Um, this included the use of, like I said, a suite of the standard tools, as well as integration of our, our specific tooling or fixtures that we had. Um, and then we reviewed each task in the work instructions uh, for a number of things. Um, so they're kind of listed here, but I'll just go a little bit more into detail. So we were looking for correct order. And um, that's namely, is there a previously installed item that is blocking access to that area? Are all the mounting brackets in place to actually mount some other piece of equipment? Um, those sorts of things. Uh, we were looking for interferences that we hadn't found um, by just looking at the model. So 
namely, does the part fit? Is there something in the path um, in order to install the part? Um, are there actual interferences in the model, the way it's designed? Um, is there clearance to get a fastener installed if you've got to uh, install a fastener for whatever you're uh, assembling as well? We were looking at mounting provisions just to make sure that the holes line up to the part that's being mounted to them. Again, access in general. Um, is there enough space to get the part in, to get your hands in, to do what you need to do to install it, um, to get any necessary, necessary tools in there to install as well? Uh, we were looking at the parts list um, to make sure that um, the work instructions and the model part numbers matched, but also that we had everything that we needed to be done with the installation at the end, end of the assembly. So was something missing in that work instruction that we really actually needed um, to complete the installation. Um, and then also just looking at clarity. I mean, um, in some cases we found that you needed to kind of install in a certain orientation and then rotate parts maybe or something along those lines. We were just double checking that the work instruction gave kind of all the information or all of the best practices about the installation of the, that particular equipment um, so that the operator could uh, understand what he needed to do as much as possible. Um, so as you can see here, uh, we definitely found a number of issues during even our small pilot. Um, so we found some missing hardware um, and an interference between parts that we hadn't found prior to this effort. Um, we also found that we didn't, in this case, um, on the top left, we didn't have any instruction on how to um, install hardware. I'm sorry, that's the, the bottom left. We didn't uh, have any instructions on how to install the hardware for this particular installation effort. Um, and then we also found a build sequence that tried to install a bracket before the corresponding grommets had been installed, which is not feasible. So um, th this is just a small sample of the, num of the issues that we found. Um, to give you an example, um, we did find, like I mentioned, areas where you needed to um, perhaps have a specific orientation in order to be as successful as possible at, orient at, at installing something. We did find um, a sequence that really didn't work, you know, sequences that really didn't work and we needed to reorder things, um, a number of different issues. So like I said, this process has been hugely successful for us and it's been so successful that we've actually decided that um, the team that had formerly been working on this with us was not locally um, situated at our York production site. So we've gone ahead and actually created a, build, a virtual build validation space right local to our production floor um, and are starting to build that capability and staff that, that space up um, so that we can continue to look at build sequences, but also start to look at things like line layouts, um, material presentation to the line, maybe material flow within the shop floor as well. Um, so we're, we're definitely looking to expand this capability based on the success we've seen um, during this early pilot with ESI. So moving on to our third topic, I mentioned at the beginning that I would spend some time talking about a partnership with Army Research Laboratory and uh, Wolf Robotics that we've um, recently wrapped up or are wrapping up um, around automating some of our proprietary weld processes. So um, currently most combat vehicle hulls are fabricated from thick armor plates and most of it is manually welded together. Um, this requires numerous weld passes um, at each weld seam for some of our thicker uh, plates and it can take several days to weld um, a base vehicle hull structure. So um, the, the base metal structure that creates this vehicle. Um, we have advanced weld technologies to reduce those those weld, num the number of weld passes, um, and they've been tested and proven, uh, but them, many of them are, are too hazardous to be performed uh, manually by a person. Um, so, and prior attempts at um, automating them have, have also been done, um, but largely focused on automating long straight seams. Um, and so this effort was looking at taking some of the more complex, shorter, um, different geometries, and actually creating a robotic weld cell to be able to incorporate the, the weld technology that we've proven and tested in kind of a new way. Uh, so this new cell 
we call it the automated weld cell um, or the advanced manufacturing cell. We have a number of different names for it, um, but it's it's equipped with uh, our proprietary um, weld technology that we call the high energy buried arc welding. Um, and that enables the high quality thick plate welds um, that we've uh, proven and tested can, can provide those quality welds with a much smaller number of weld passes. Um, the cell also contains a high capacity multi-access access positioning system um, that can manipulate our multi-ton vehicle structures into the ideal welding positions um, needed for these processes. Um, it includes uh, obviously uh, a dock, which um, we've, I said we partnered with Wolf Robotics. They have uh, what they call um, smart dock technology that we were able to utilize here. Um, that means we have a kind of a holding fixture that is applied to the hull that can kind of rapidly seat itself into the positioner um, that you see here. And then our, our robotic equipment was an ABB robot and controller that uh, Wolf helped us uh, program and integrate into the system. Um, this robotic weld cell has multiple benefits for uh, what we call next generation combat vehicles. So the future new design vehicles that we're currently working on to modernize the fleet, um, as well as quality and performing uh, weldments in a, a much higher rate um, and results in much better vehicle performance. Um, and the automation that we've been able to put into this obviously reduces the weld time. Uh, we're estimating by nearly 80%. Um, and most of our data at this point is, is confirming that that is the, the actual return on investment that we will see. Um, and that is important to us. Again, I mentioned it earlier in the, in the discussion, we are ramping up our production rates significantly to meet our customer demands. And so the ability to automate and make these well processes occur much quack, quicker, I almost said quacker, much quicker um, is critical to us being able to meet those delivery demands. So, um, again, the development, integration, and prove out of this robotic cell was definitely a partnership between the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command um, Army Research Laboratory down in Aberdeen, Maryland. Um, obviously, BAE Systems was involved in this effort highly, um, and we are the what they call the transition partner. So we are actually um, have actually transitioned this into a pr production environment. Um, and then also uh, a huge par part of the partnership was Wolf Robotics. Um, all of this work was done in support of the, initially support of the Armored Multipurpose Vehicle Program, which is um, our robotic weld cells first kind of customer, quote unquote. Um, however, because of the success of this weld cell, we are already in partnership with Wolf to purchase a second unit. Um, for additional combat vehicle production needs uh, at our York site. So all in all, very successful partnership. Um, so I wanted to go in a little bit about um, how we went about this automation. And um, it was very much uh, a step-by-step -step kind of gated approach uh, that we took. So the initial feasibility assessments, um, preliminary and final design, and then the integration into the production environment were very well um, controlled. We had tests and um, results that we wanted to see before we were ready to move to the next stage. Uh, so as owners of the kind of the proprietary weld technology, BAE systems um, provided that kind of initial concept of the weld equipment that we would need to be successful. Um, but Wolf was critical to the partnership in providing kind of the initial concept of what the robotic equipment would need to be and what the positioning system should be. Uh, and they, once we've kind of combined those concepts together, Wolf was able to perform kind of a detailed simulation of the weld process. Um, and that we, we call that, we called that the REACH study because really what was going on there was both to understand um, which weld seams we could reach, which we had the most likelihood of actually being able to weld in a good position and get quality welds um, time after time. Um, we also, at that point, once the, the REACH study was done, or kind of in parallel, I guess, with the REACH study, we did a lot of feasibility tests. So we were using the actual weld equipment that we uh, were planning to install. We were using a lab version of the same robot, and we were doing as many uh, full-length passes of the welds and 
um, things like that to kind of make sure that the equipment all work together and that um, as much as we could at that subscale uh, phase, trying to prove that kind of the movement of the hull and the movement of the robot around the hull wouldn't cause any issues for the welding. And, and that did, because we did it kind of at a subscale, you'll find that we did find issues when we went to full scale um, that we couldn't see at that subscale. So I'll talk about that on the next slide. But um, And then, so once we kind of, we really were um, happy with the results of the REACH study, uh, we couldn't get every weld seam, but we could get a good number of the weld seams uh, for um, the more complex part of the hull structure. Uh, and the feasibility studies proved that the equipment kind of, it looks like it really worked well together. Um, enough cooling, you know, all the parameters that make a good weld um, were there with this equipment set up. And we didn't see any kind of red herrings at that point anyway, uh, about the movement um, causing any issues. Um, so after that, we moved kind of into the detailed design and equipment purchase, which was largely led by Wolf, um, kind of going out and buying that material and beginning the integration into a final weld cell. So um, following the build, which Wolf did at their Fort Collins, Colorado site initially, um, they welded two full scale hulls together for us. So we did a lot of the preliminary welding um, tack welding together um, of the hull at the BAE York site and then shipped those tack welded hulls out to Wolf at the Fort Collins site. Um, and they began to um, weld those two full scale hulls together. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we did identify concerns at this point, uh, things that we hadn't seen during the subscale feasibility tests. Um, a lot of those were around wire feeding, which looking back now, um, because of how often the hull moves and the orientation that it moves uh, or the, the rotation of it so that we don't have welds um, with too much heat at a single time. Um, it it kind of was like, we should have a little bit of a, oh, we should have known that was probably something we should look into more. Um, but we did have a lot of wire feeding where because of the movement of the robot relative to the hull and the feeder and everything, we were getting some issues with wire feeding and, and kind of not feeding as well as we needed. And then we also had some cooling issues uh, that we had not anticipated either. Um, so uh, initially the robot had operated with a, a thicker weld wire uh, than it currently does. Uh, so, but because of those kind of technical issues with the wire feeding and the cooling, um, we actually went down to a, a thinner wire um, and we proved that, that going down to that thinner wire was something we could successfully handle, that the feeding issues and the cooling issues were no longer a problem at that thinner wire. Um, so that is what, we're, what equipment we're working with today. Um, once the cell, once the full uh, two full scale hulls were welded at Wolf and we were happy with the quality of the welds, um, Wolf obviously disassembled that weld cell and started to ship all of the equipment to York and we re rebuilt it here in York. Um, after we rebuilt it here in York, we did another two full scale hulls here in York. Um, and we began to kind of do a full visual full um, NDT inspection process on those halls as we were going through. Um, another thing I'll say that uh, I think surprised a lot of people outside of our project team, but wasn't a surprise for the project team was just the amount of time we spent on a lot of these first halls before we actually were ready to say we're, we're good to go in production. Um, those first few halls we spent weeks building as we were kind of manually following the program and performing the welds and making sure they were exactly how we wanted them to be. Um, and I think outside of our project team, that was something that other people hadn't expected to need to do. Um, but we got through it. Um, and I will say when we were doing those two initial pre-production hauls, and then as we kind of started to go into production, but slowly into production, um, we found some other issues, stuff that we hadn't expected as well. These weren't as much technical issues as they were, uh, I'll call them logistic issues. So because early on in the phase, we were operating the, the robot at much, much slower than what it would normally do during full production, um, because we were doing that manual following of each weld seam and um, checking to make sure that the robot was following the program properly or that the program was performing weld properly, I should say. Um, it was taking us a lot longer to weld the hulls together. 
Um, and we have a, a code requirement that requires us to clean every so often. And we were exceeding that code requirement and having to take the hull off of the robot to clean the weld seams and put it back on, um, which was is not something that will come up when we're actually operating at full, full speed on the robot. Um, but it was something that came up during those initial phases. And so in order to kind of not have that removal and cleaning time really start to hamper our ability to kind of get up to speed, um, we did go through and prove to our customer um, that we could create quality welds without doing those cleaning processes. Um, and that was actually interesting because it helps us in a lot of other areas in our shop floor where we have to perform those cleaning processes as well. Um, and so kind of taking, going, going that approach and actually trying to get that cleaning process taken out um, was really important in other ways as well. Um, so it wasn't really, it, it wasn't actually just cleaning um, because of that code requirement, but between passes of a weld, we're supposed to clean as well. Um, and we hadn't installed sophisticated enough inspection equipment onto the robot to be able to perform a good enough inspection for us to feel really confident that there was no debris or anything in the weld seams. So our robot has cleaning capability. It has wire brushes. Um, but again, we didn't have that inspection capability for us to be able to actually say like no bristles had come off. All of the debris had been vacuumed out of the weld seam. Uh, so we really had a kind of a gap there where we couldn't prove to ourselves that it was clean, as clean as it needed to be. Um, and so that's another area where instead of, instead of adding the sophisticated inspection capability, we did some testing to prove that even if there were debris in the weld seams, we could still, this process was um, rigorous enough that we could still create quality welds. Again, something that helped in a lot of other areas in our shop floor as well, or could potentially um, help. So interesting dilemmas that we hadn't expected to kind of crop up, but um, things that we had to come through all the same. Um, so as we sit today, the system is currently operational and being used um, on our Anthe production line. We are running at full speed. Um, and now that we've got that equipment running up uh, at full speed, we're purchasing the second cell, but we're also going back um, and using a lab uh, robot setup with Wolf to actually look at that larger wire. So we're not satisfied with where we are yet today. Um, we really do think that larger weld wire is something that we can execute and, and make some tweaks to the equipment and really be able to reduce the cycle time on this weld process even further. So we do have that study kind of coming up here at the end of the year with, again, partnership with um, Army Research Laboratory and Wolf Robotics. So more, to, I guess a little more to come on this one as well, but also a, a successful transition to production for this piece of work as well. So again, um, I thank you so much for joining me today for this topic. I know a couple of the things kind of veered away from maybe what you thought initially we were going to talk about. I hope we covered enough of the augmented reality piece um, for you to be interested um, and get some pieces out of, you know, what our journey for augmented reality was. But I think virtual reality has just as much um, application in what we're doing. And I think this other successful application of technology hopefully gave you some, some good insights into um, phase it, you know, phasing technology insertion, um, trying to partnership with other people, and also just a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a, uh, a lesson on the things that crop up while you're trying to insert new technology into your production space, um, that it, it's going to happen. Um, it's just a matter of kind of where, where it happens and being flexible enough to uh, adapt and keep moving forward. So again, thank you for your time today. Uh, and I look forward to our live Q&A session. Thank you.